Well, hi everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Who'd have thought we'd be back again after last week? So hopefully everyone can hear me okay and see me. Um, this has been a very popular webinar today, so delighted to have so many people involved. So let's see, hopefully we can get, uh, get Dominic on board and, uh, and, and see and hear from him in a moment. But thanks very much for joining us. Obviously we had seven webinars last week and, um, and here we are again. So three additional webinars organised for, for this week. So I'm hoping we can uh, link up with, with Dominic. I think he might just be muted at the moment. So let's just get him, see if he can hear us. I can hear you, Dan. Great, perfect. Well, that's always a very good start. Very encouraging. <laughs> Technology works. <laughs> no, that's great. Well, I'm very pleased that uh, you've been able to join us. So we've got um, 55 people so far have, have come on board. Crikey. You, you can see me okay, can you? I can, I can hear you, I can see you, everything is good. Perfect, well that's really great. Well, we'll just wait for some more people to, to join in. So, but, but just while we're waiting, just to explain, some of you I know are joining us for the first time. So last week, uh, we organized seven webinars uh, with various people from across sort of the racing industry. And the purpose for that was to try and get a bit of an insight, partly how the lockdown was affecting them, but also hopefully to broaden our knowledge and our education a little bit on different parts of racing. And since there's an opportunity to perhaps to speak to people who uh, might otherwise be a bit busy at the moment, we thought it was a good opportunity to try and broaden our own understanding of, of how racing works. Um, so it's been great to have so many people logging into these webinars. Obviously everyone's a, a member of Foxtrot Racing Syndicate and hopefully keen to learn and expand their own their own knowledge. So um, we've got, what have we got, 60 people now involved with us and just to explain for those of you joining us for the first time at the bottom of your screen, you may need to tap the screen to get it up, there's a little box and if you press that um, it is, says Q&A and you can type in there any questions and if you send in any questions through that I'll then pass them on uh, later on during this webinar. So we said we'd go, we try and keep the webinars to about 30 minutes but Dominic has very kindly said that he's happy to extend that if there's a host of, of good questions coming in so we'll see how we get on with the questions and we'll try and get through as many as we as we can but Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you tap that you can type in any questions and I will then pass those on uh, later on uh, this afternoon. Great. Well, Dominic, if you're happy to, to, to kick off, we'll, um, we've got 60 people with us. It's past 12 o'clock, so let, let's get going. So if I could ask you the first question, which sort of I suppose is, did, did you always want to be a handicapper? I mean, how on earth does, does a role like that come about? Um, did I always want to be a handicapper? I always wanted to do something in racing. Um, I was brought up... Um, with racing. I attended my first race meeting at the age of four. Um, my father was a huge fan. Uh, we were lucky enough to live on the outskirts of London, so we had plenty of sort of Saturday tracks within easy reach. We had Kempton, Sandown, Ascot, Newbury, and then we used to travel a little bit further afield to Cheltenham for the big Saturday meetings there. Um, so yeah, I always wanted to do something within racing. Um, my initial intention was to try and get into the journalistic side of it. Um, and uh, I did what every 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old does when they've decided what they want to do with their life. I wrote all the normal letters to Peter O'Sullivan and Clive Graham and people like that. And one or two of them sent me some very nice letters back. Um, the sort of letters I now send back to people who ask me how to get into handicapping. Um, so, and I, I got my initial uh, break with a company called Trainers Record. I don't know whether any of you guys will have heard of Trainers Record. It was run by Peter Jones, who subsequently became chairman of the Tote. And he had ran a little publishing business down in uh, deepest, darkest Dorset, uh, just outside um, Bridport. And uh, we produced two books a year, looking at sort of trainer trends. You know, where did people like to start their maidens? what was the sort of pattern of the way they campaign their horses? Was there a particular course or jockey combination that people should look out for? And then we moved on to doing form guides for various newspapers. Um, and then we put the database together for the Racing Post when that first came into being. Um, and we used to send all the data up a line in the old days, so a coal driven line from uh, Dorset to London. And then what happened from there was that after a couple of years, uh, the database moved in-house to Rains Park, where the Racing Post was um, based. 
and the staff that had been down in Dorset moved with it. I um, moved up to London and after about 18 months was offered the job of Jumps Postmark, um, which obviously is their form ratings and things sort of went from there. Did five or six years doing that and then applied for a job with the BHB as it was then um, and, and thankfully got it. And that, that was the sort of end of my career move, so to speak. I've been there ever since. Well, that's very interesting. Dominic, just, I don't know if it's possible, but you, you're very dark. I, I don't yeah, know it's something, it's I'm not entirely thing. sure why it is, to be honest, Dan. I've had this issue before, um, and if I move it slightly further away, it gets slightly better, but I don't know whether it's the lighting in here or what, but even when I move into the kitchen, I'm still very dark. I don't, it must be something to do with the resolution on my computer or something. I, I can do what you've done and put a fancy background in and see if that helps. I usually like the uh, the Pacific Island, but I don't know that's it. <laughs> well, you said a fancy background, but actually what you don't know is this, for the last uh, 10 days, I've been traveling the world to different race courses. And uh, oh. what I'm asking people to do is have a guess at which race course uh, you're at. So um, today I'm visiting another race course that we've had a Foxtrot runner for the, well, in the last 12 months. So. Any guesses at what race course I'll be at, and I'll, I'll let you know at the end which race course I'm visiting today. Ah, so, uh, I see. Certainly I can't not tell a fancy you background. On. You can see it's very, very warm here as well today. So, uh, hopefully, members have a guess at, at which race course I'm visiting. But uh, no, Dominic, that's fine. That's. Uh, I, that's say, I, I can open the curtains. It doesn't seem to make any difference. Yeah. It's just it's something to do with the I don't know the the lighting coming off from my my laptop or something. Not a problem. Well, it's most important we can hear what you're saying and, uh, and we can see you fine anyway. So that's that's great. So let, can I ask the, the next question? Just can you just explain um, you know, what your role actually is at the, at the BHA? What is head of handicapping? Hmm, yeah. Well, we've got a team of 12 handicappers, Dan. Um, and obviously they are um, since Phil's retirement uh, in June 2018. They've been under my leadership. Um, <clears throat> We, I mean, basically, you know, basically I run the team um, and I suppose anything that happens handicapping wise is ultimately uh, my responsibility. Um, we have 12 handicappers, including myself, and uh, we would at the height of the flat season have nine handicappers working on the flat and three holding the fort for summer jumping. And then as we get into the winter and obviously uh, the, the flat season turns to all weather and we have less fixtures, but jumping is really getting going, then we would switch gradually three of those handicappers across from the flat to the jumps. So by the time we get to December, January, we're basically operating six and six um, flat and jumps. I also, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as uh, part of my responsibility, I represent the BHA on various committees. Um, including the World Rankings Committee, uh, which I'm sure all your members will know all about. We meet in Hong Kong every December to come up with the annual rankings. And I also represent the BHA on the Breeders' Cup Selection Committee. So uh, I have about nine or ten hours in front of a computer one Monday in October, rattling through a whole heap of American two-year-olds that I know very little about in terms of coming up with some pecking order. Um, but it's, they, I have to say, Breeders' Cup look after you very well. We do, we do work hard for them through the season. We're continually updating our, our ratings for their graded races. Um, and they also run a poll, I don't know whether you know, through the, through the summer. There's about, I think there's about 60 or 70 of us, whether it be handicappers or journalists or high-profile American racing figures who vote for their top horses in each category. So we take part in that. But in return, they, they provide... Pretty much all expenses paid week or so in uh, in wherever the venue is for each year's Breeders' Cup. Sounds very nice. <laughs> so you mentioned there's a team of, uh, let's take summer jumping. So um, <coughs> we've got what 10, 10 horses that we're looking to go summer jumping with once racing resumes. Well, so the three handicappers looking after them, how is that divided up? Do they do different distances? Does one do hurdles, one do jumps? Is it random? How is yeah, that over, over jumps, what tends to happen through the winter is that you'll have three, three hurdling and three chasing. And it's divided up by distance. So somebody will do all the races around two miles, somebody will do two and a half, and somebody will do three. 
um, on over in the summer, once all the, the guys have moved across, then um, we will have two working on the hurdles and one working on the chases, but they, they can be quite flexible. So if somebody has a holiday, somebody can switch across and help out on the other code or whatever. And in terms of the flat, um, we have uh, a main two-year-old handicapper, uh, Graham Smith, who I'm sure you've probably come across in some way, shape or form. <coughs> uh, we will, he will get some help as the season progresses from a couple of other handicappers. But as far as the three-year-old pluses are concerned, we divide again, everything up by distance. So everybody will have a core group of horses. So somebody will do the, all the five furlong races and maybe a few six furlongs. Somebody else will do all the, the rest of the six furlongs and a few seven. And then my particular category, my core horses are uh, the top milers and the top 10 furlong horses. Um, and obviously that ties in with my work on Breeders' Cup and on the world rankings because I get to look at two of the most important categories in terms of those areas, you know, the milers and the 10 furlong horses. So I'm, if I sit on a committee, I can just answer questions almost immediately about those horses at those distances. But again, you know, if, if the mile and a half handicap is off on holiday, um, I might be called in to deal with a few class six, seven mile and a half handicaps, a few selling plates. Um, so we have to be flexible, but everybody does have their core group of horses. Yeah. Um, that was very interesting. So can you just explain to us what the purpose of the handicap system is? What are you actually trying to achieve? Well, about um, somewhere between 60 and 65% of all races that are run on our race courses are handicaps. And as I'm sure you and your members will appreciate, you know, not all horses are good enough to win level weights races, allowance races or whatever. So basically in putting on uh, the majority of races as handicaps, we are trying to provide winning opportunities and opportunities for horses to be competitive in the right grade. Um, and obviously by doing that, we have to facilitate that we banned our handicaps. So on the flat, you know, we will start at, um, I think the lowest, I think we still have a few naught to 50s through the winter, but there will be 55, 60s, 65, 70s, obviously working your way up to the top handicaps, which are unbanded. Um, the Hunt Cup is open to any horse, but it will have to carry a weight commensurate with, the, with a high rating. And then obviously on the jumps, it's the same sort of thing, you know, naught to 125, naught 130s, 135. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to channel horses into races against, so they're, they're racing against horses of similar-ish ability and therefore giving them all an opportunity to be competitive in the right grade. So one thing I wanted to understand is why do flat, why are ratings on the flat different <coughs> to the jumps in terms of you might have a horse that's rated 90 on the flat, but that, you know, if they're 90 over jumps, that means something completely different in yeah. terms of their ability. It, it, it's basically a historical, um, Dan, if you go back far enough, the top weight in a, Jumps handicap was 12 stone seven, which um, in terms of the total number of pounds is 175. And the top weight in a flat handicap was 10 stone, which is 140 pounds. So when the scales were first put together, that, what was, that was what was used. It was the equivalent of a top weight in a handicap on, under that code. So it's very much a historic sort of basis. Have you thought about changing, trying to bring the two together? Um, no, there have been one or two people that suggest that the flat handicap doesn't actually stretch horses out. It's a little bit too compressed and you don't have quite a, a big enough range. And there are countries in the world that actually um, would operate a domestic handicap um, as well as the international handicap. So Hong Kong, for instance, would have their own domestic handicap as well as keeping their top horses on the world level as well. Um, no, I don't. It, it, personally, I think it works pretty well. I think people are, know where they stand with it. They, they know what it's all about. Um, and as you will know, that people in racing don't like change. They, they don't like innovation. And I think if you suddenly said to people on the flat, we're going to move to a 0-175 scale as we do on the jumps, People say, oh, no, we don't need to do that. You know, we know where we stand. We know what a, we know what a 75 is and we know what an 85 is. We know what a 100 is. Don't, don't go buggering about with it. Just leave it where it is. Yeah. So we've got a, a, a lot of maiden horses, perhaps we bought off the flat or, or unraced or B 
been point to pointing. Can you just explain the process for them to get a handicap mark? Well, it's obviously slightly different on the flat as it is on uh, over, over jumps. Um, I mean, basically what we're looking to do is ask a horse to race a certain number of times um, and dependent on the results within those races, um, we will give it a handicap mark. But what we need to be relatively confident about, Dan, is that we've seen enough to handicap any given horse relatively accurately. I'm never going to say we're going to we're going to um, rate them totally accurately because that's just not possible with racehorses. Um, but what we want is horses going into handicaps where we feel that connections arrive at the races feeling as though they are certainly not disadvantaged um, against other horses. And obviously from our perspective, we don't want them advantaged either. The whole point of a handicap is to give each horse theoretically, and I would stress theoretically, an equal chance on the form that is shown on the race course. So you mentioned there about form on the race course. Does that mean if you've got a horse that runs in a maiden hurdle, let's say, um, you wouldn't consider how it's run in a national hunt flat race or in a point to point? Well, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting point, and it's one that's been brought up not only by trainers, owners and whatever, but it's something we've discussed within the BHA. In terms of um, technically, um, it, the, the, the form shown in a bumper would not count directly towards uh, the rating given after the required number of runs over hurdles. The problem is, of course, that you can't unknow what you know. It's a bit like horses going from the flat up to, to, to hurdles. If you know that the horse is a 95, 100 rated horse and it's going hurdling and it runs moderately on its first couple of hurdles, you, you know that the inherent ability of that horse is better than it has currently shown over hurdles. Now, there may be all sorts of reasons why it doesn't transfer from one code to the other. Um, and it's the same with bumpers. If you've, if you've got a horse that's, you know, run well in bumpers, showing form that we would consider to be 115, 120 sort of equivalent over hurdles, and it then runs a couple of hurdle races, two or three hurdle races, runs its qualifying runs, and is only running to 85 or 90, then you're starting to think to yourself, well, why? Is it that it can't jump? Is it not suited by jumping hurdles? Has there been an issue between its bumper races and its hurdle races. Um, and you would obviously be very cautious about giving a horse that you know has ability of a certain level, a rating that is very obviously a good deal lower than that. Um, you wouldn't put it in on 120 because it had run into 120 in bumpers, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking, why is this 120 bump horse only running to 90 over hurdles? So you then either have to make a decision as to whether you're going to refuse the rating um, and withhold the rating at that point and say to the trainer, look, we know it's better than this. You've got good flat form, you've got good bumper form, and there's something just not right about the, the, the opening runs over hurdles. Or you say, do you know what? Um, I can't find a reason why there should be this sort of difference. I'm, I'm going to put it in, but for the good of everybody and for the good of the majority over the minority, I'm going to put it in slightly higher than it appears to have actually been running over hurdles. You know, our job is to, as I said to you earlier, is to give everybody a feeling that they are not disadvantaged and we don't want horses advantaged going into, into handicaps. We want everybody to feel that when they turn up at the races, they've got a chance of some sort. They've got a chance of being competitive. So often you see, I well, don't say often, but sometimes you'll see a jockey, let's say, trying to win cosily, not, not trying to win by as far as they could have done if they'd really sort of ridden out their horse. Is that a pointless exercise? Or actually, you know, does the handicapper just look at how far a horse has <laughs> won by? Or does the handicapper watch the race and consider what might have happened or what you know, could have happened, say, had that horse been fully ridden out? Oh yeah, I mean we. Uh, I will rot watch any given race, probably depending on the type of track that it's run on. I mean, for instance, um, down a straight track, uh, you probably wouldn't expect too much trouble, um, too many sort of tactical incidents, shall we say? 
Um, but if you're, if you're on a turning track, then obviously that's a different ball game. You know, the, the draw comes into play if you're drawn wide and you have to drop in. So I will probably watch any given race at least half a dozen times just to get a first two or three times just to get a feel for it. You know, which horses were advantaged? Were those drawn high, those drawn low? Was there a tactical advantage in running prominently? Was there a tactical advantage in being held up? You'll look at the sectionals if they're available. Um, one of the things I always do is on my result sheet is highlight the horses that run in the first four um, through the, the early to the mid part of the race. I'll highlight in a different color those that are held up in the first half of the race and then just leave those that run in mid div blank just to see at the finish whether there's any sort of pattern as to which horses appear to have been suited by the way the race was run. As far as winners are concerned, as I said, you know, part of our job is to, uh, to, to equalize the chance of all horses. Um, and if a horse has won hard held, if we only count the, the winning length margin as two pounds, then that obviously is not um, a true representation of the horse's ability or his superiority over the horses that he has just beaten. So it's then up to us um, to, I suppose the best way to put it is to come up with an educated guesstimate as to how much that horse had in hand. And one of the sort of criteria I use is um, if I was the owner of the second or the third or the fourth, what sort of pull would I be looking for with that horse to tempt me to take it on again? So if I own the second and this thing is one hard held by a length and I've only put it up two pounds more than the second, absolutely no way as the owner of that horse would I say we've got any chance of turning that round or being competitive. Um, if you put it up six for a length, saying that you know over a mile that it was um it should have won by about three lengths then as the owner you're thinking okay i've got six pounds for two lengths i've got six pounds for a length that's certainly more than normal do we take it on and then once you get up to sort of seven or eight then they'll think yeah go on he's given us a chance now seven eight pounds for a length we'll give it a crack so that's sort of part of my thought process another part of the thought process is and, and it's not a, something i'm a huge fan of but does work on occasions is if a horse is absolutely hacked up in a certain grade of race, you certainly might be looking to get it out of that grade next time. Um, and if it's been particularly impressive, you might look to jump it up, not only through the next grade, but take it to the grade after that. Um, as I say, all, all we're trying to be is trying to be fair on everybody. Um, doesn't always work. And look, it's a very inexact science. But I always say that if we're having problems um, working through a piece of form, then so is everybody else. And punters, tipsters, bookmakers, whoever, are going to say, follow the same problems or are going to have the same problems evaluating a piece of form as we are. Um, and therefore, you know, it, it, it just poses a question that we've tried to answer and we're now leaving it to others to come up with the answer where we've, we, we've set the question. So can you, do you only look at how horses have performed or do you also consider how you think horses will perform in the future. So let, let me give you an example of what I mean. If, if you had a horse, two horses that ran in the same race, off the same rating, one had been off the track for say three years and one had run three weeks earlier and perhaps was a bit fitter and they both ran exactly the same way, would you treat them the same or would you say actually one is likely to have come on for that run, therefore I'd expect if they met next time one would finish ahead of the other or do you simply have to take what happened in that race and, and if they both finish in the same position treat them equally no you can do i mean whatever we do we we do we look at each horse individually look at its profile look at its recent form i mean for instance we what we do is we have a database whereby we will put a performance figure on every horse every time it runs so and when I'm, there is a difference between performance figures and handicap racing. So handicap ratings is the mark that the horse is either set to run off or has run off. The performance figure is what we actually believe the horse has run to. What is the numeric representation of that performance? And it often will not tie in with the handicap mark that it has run off. But we will use those performance figures as a basis for future handicap marks. So say, for instance, you've got a horse that's finished fourth um, and again, I'm going to use a flat example here, but it's the same for, for jumping. If you've got a horse that's finished four, three times off the same rating, say 80, and it's run to 80, 78 and 78 in finishing fourth. The first thing he says, okay, it's now had three cracks off 80. It's been doing its best. 
Um, and it doesn't appear to be able to get its head in front. And the last two handicap marks are below, uh, the last two performances are actually below the handicap mark that it's run off. So what you'd probably do with that horse is ease it up a little bit, either put it to 78 or 79, bring it down a pound or two, even though it's finished fourth. If you've got a horse, as you say, that's been off for a couple of years and had solid form whilst it was away, um, okay, it may have had a problem, but first run for a couple of years, um, if it finishes 10th, you would probably, and, and, and I'm not going to say definitely, because it may have been a horse that was regressive two years ago and had been tumbling down the handicap. It may have got a string of duck eggs against its name. As I say, prior to the injury, prior to the layoff, it may have been regressive, in which case you may continue to take it down a little bit. Um, but if it had good, strong, solid form prior to the, the layoff, then you'd probably leave it where it was for that first start. So, and trainers often phone up and say, oh, hold on a minute, you've dropped the fourth a pound and I've finished three lengths behind it, but you've left me where I am. And you say, yeah, because we're not just looking at that one race in isolation. You know, you've won your previous two starts. We think you've got solid form. And for whatever reason, you just haven't quite run to the same level. Whereas the horse that we've dropped a pound has now finished fourth three times off 80. And we think it's just time to ease it up a little bit um, because it's doing its, it's doing its best, but it's just banging its head against a brick wall a little bit. Yeah, very interesting. And we're getting lots and lots of questions in, which is great. We've got 70 people that have joined us. So absolutely fantastic. Lots of interest in this. Um, one thing I'd like to know, are you more likely to win a race statistically if you're top weight or if you're bottom weight? Uh, I think the answer is top weight. Um, I, I think, um, and it's a conversation that I've had with a number of people, um, I actually think class is a lot more important than a lot of people believe. They, they think that the handicapping system can negate the class issue. I'm not sure it can. Um, and I think if you've got, it's a bit like being a flat, flat, flat track bully at cricket. You know, if, if you're on a nice easy pitch, um, you, you can bang away moderate bowlers the whole time, put them into a test team on the same pitch and they become actually relatively moderate because they're just not quite at that level. And I think horses, and that may sound a bit silly, but are the same. I think there are some horses that find it a lot easier to carry big weights against very moderate horses than carrying lesser weight against some really good horses. And yes, I think um, it, it, class is important. Um, and one of the things that I've actually thought in the past, and it'll never happen, is actually maybe we should be not publishing um, ratings um, in sort of pound increments, but maybe we should be publishing just bands. So you're either a, a, a 0 to 70 horse, a 0 to 75 horse, a 0 to 80 horse. And all we're doing is channeling horses of, the, of similar ability into the same types of races, which may not even have to be handicapped, um, because you know then the class factor would disappear. Um, but as I say, that that that's not going to happen. But to answer your question, yes, I think statistically, uh, top weights will have a better record than bottom weights um, because of that class factor. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, as you may or may not be aware, you know, we we also mainly, in fact, at the moment, we're all national hunt. But a lot of the time we're buying horses that have already run. So a lot of them already have got handicap ratings. So we're thinking about how we can, how can we win a race and enough races with a horse that's already handicapped. And part of that is perhaps by moving trainer, changing the distance it's running. You know, we've seen something that we think connections before haven't. But another thing that we've regularly done is taken the horse and just dropped it in class. They've been running yeah. in a bottom weight in, in races and we've swapped that round and run him top weight in lower grade race. And we found that to be, you know, I think it's fair to say very successful. And that yeah. would tie in, I think, with, with what you're saying. Um, we've, we've had uh, another question here, um, which I'd like to ask you. Adam, Adam Roach has asked, um, sometimes you might have a naught to 110 handicap with horses that are rated 112. Yeah. So now I know obviously this was was an idea that's introduced. So can you just explain a little bit about the idea of having um, horses rated obviously up to two pounds uh, extra running, why that came about and has it been successful? Yeah, one of the uh, it, the, the original discussion um, started a, a fair while back, actually, and the um, the concept was rejected a couple of times, largely by the NTF, funnily enough. Um, but we as handicappers, we get a lot of um, phone calls and emails, communication from trainers regarding horses who are 
possibly a pound or maybe two pounds above a handicap uh, band. So for instance, uh, if you've got a, a hurdler rated 121, um, in the old days, we were forcing you basically into a naught to 125 or above. And trainers would phone up and say, oh, you know, this thing's regressive and um, it's got problems and, you know, the, the normal stuff we hear on a regular basis. And, you know, the, the, the favorite one is, oh, it's, it's, it's probably only got two or three runs left in it and then we'll have to retire it or whatever. You know, it'd be really, really helpful if you could drop us a pound and then we could run in the 0 to 120 at Worcester in three weeks time or whatever. Um, and basically, I, funnily enough, it was an idea that I hatched with, uh, with Phil Smith. And I said, well, look, why don't we put it to the BHA that we actually allow horses in at either one pound or two pounds above the handicap band? And the advantages will be twofold. One, it'll stop that type of telephone call. Um, and two, uh, it may well help with field sizes. You know, if, and I, in fact, after we had um, after we'd introduced it, I think there was a seven runner handicap at Wolverhampton where four of the runners were a pound or two above the handicap band. So we, we kind of immediately saw a result in as much that a three runner handicap became a seven runner handicap. Um, so that's the reason behind it. Um, and what I would say and go to go back to the conversation that we've just had, um, it's been very successful that, that for those that have used it because the strike rate of those horses is actually higher um, than, than the norm, um, than the base. And so uh, again, I think sort of highlighting that class is probably, is definitely important, um, but it does provide an opportunity. And again, for those horses that are, are coming down the handicap who are regressing, um, one of the things, you know, again, one of the, the sort of tactics we use with horses is to try and get them down a band um, to try and help them become competitive. But sometimes you just can't do that. The figures won't allow you to do it. And if it means you've got to take a horse from 125 to 120, but the figures say, actually, do you know what? You can't, that, that's just taking it a bit too far in one hit. If you take it from 125 to 121 and 122, it can actually still get into that 120, but have to carry the weight that's commensurate with its rating. Hmm. Is there a, a, a mean and a median national hunt rating which stays the same or does it change? Um, well, it does change, but it changes um, minimally. It will literally be, um, it's something that we monitor very closely and we, um, because obviously what we want to make sure is that, and it, again, the same flat and jumps that a 125 this season is of the same standard as a 125 two seasons ago, three seasons ago, five seasons ago, or whatever. The, 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 the median will change. We prefer to use medians rather than means. Um, the median will change by a pound or two. Um, but at the end of each season, we will, well, we actually have ongoing lists, so we know where we stand. But obviously, at the end of the season, we can make a final judgment on where we stand with the median. Um, and if, if it has risen, um, then we will, I won't say it will actually affect the way we handicap, but it, we, we will make an effort to try and get that median that back down, that pound in the first month or so of the, current, of, of the next season. Um, and again, you, we, uh, we employed James Willoughby actually to do a lot of work with us um, a couple of years ago. And he basically said that, um, you know, to get the median down two or three pounds, you are literally having to take a horse down half a pound more per race, um, which frankly is, you know, I, I have no concerns about that at all. But yes, it's something, and, and a lot, we're doing a lot more statistical analysis now, Dan, over the last two or three years. Um, every, every decision, well, I won't say every decision, but more of our policies and more of our handicapping decisions are now based on statistical proof. Do you know what the median rating is for National Hunt horses? Uh, now you're asking. I think it's somewhere. I, th I, I could look it up for you and I could email it to you afterwards. I think it's somewhere in the teens. I think it's sort of you're looking at sort of 14, 15, 16, something like that. So 114, 115. I, I will, I will, I will double check that. But it's. Um, um, yeah. I didn't mean to put you on the spot with that question. So you can email it on. Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was quite interesting. I didn't mean to put you on the spot with that. No, one. no, no. It's, that's fine. And I can tell you that on the flat, it. Um, the, it, it tends to be hover around the 70 mark. Hmm. Um, so if it's, and, and again, one of the things that, one of the things that um, the, the racing department will look at our file on a regular basis so that they can uh, make the racing program fit our file. So obviously there's a huge number of horses between 
55 and 75 on the flat, they're going to likely need a lot more opportunities than horses rated 95 plus. So they will tailor the race program to the size and shape of our file. Yeah, interesting. So um, tell me, I'm, I'm conscious of, of, of time, but if, if you've got time for a couple more questions, that would of be course, great. Of course, yeah, no um, problem. One of the sort of re reoccurring themes perhaps in the questions are about, about older horses um, and, and perhaps the, the concept, whether or not it's true or not, that horses go up in the handicap very quickly, but, but perhaps come, come down more slowly. And do you think, um, the, just slightly sort of summarising the, these questions, do you think that older horses um, can have a fair go in the handicap system if they are being and running against sort of unexposed horses who are improving. Do you think that the system is fair to older horses that perhaps just aren't getting any better and dropping two pounds every week, every time they run, having to run against young novices? Um, or do you think the system actually is fair and it is how it is? Um, I, what I would say to that, Dan, is that the system, and I'll, I'll be brutally honest here, that the, the system um, is not perfect. I don't think anybody would claim that any handicapping system in any sport is perfect. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, you're, you're looking at greyhound racing or whatever. There is no, there is no perfect handicapping system. But I do think that the system that we've got is probably as good as you're going to find. Um, and one of the advantages of uh, the analysis that we do now is to highlight those horses that are put at a disadvantage by the system as it stands and the way it is facilitated currently. Um, the, 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 the problem is, of course, that um, there will always be people looking to take advantage of that system. And if, for instance, we came up with an across the board policy of every time you get beaten, you get dropped three pounds or five pounds or whatever, there will be people who will very quickly take advantage of that particular uh, policy and say, right, we'll give it three quiet ones and we'll be down 12 pounds or 15 pounds or whatever. And that would be very much to the detriment of those horses, particularly those horses that keep finishing second and third and second and third, and that the beaten horses, you know, uh, uh, who uh, had a little toddle around the back, if we can put it in that sort of way, all of a sudden are going to be 15 pounds better off in a month's time. Um, and one, one, of the, one of the sort of uh, the, the, the biggest, I won't say it's a criticism, but one of the frustrations I think of the system, not only with older horses taking on younger horses, but it are those horses that keep finishing second and third, second and third, second and third. Now, the analysis will tell you that actually next time out, any horse that finishes second or third has got a, 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 an equal chance of winning to the winner. Um, but when you're the owner of one of those horses, it doesn't seem like it. And the frustration is to go up a little bit for being placed. And it get, becomes even more frustrating for them when they realise that something that's finished seventh, eighth or ninth has gone down five and they've got to meet it on eight pound worst term next time. Um, so it's a very difficult balance to strike in terms of being fair to beaten horses, older horses or whatever, um, but at the same time considering the, the, the future chances of those horses that have obviously done their stuff, um, run their race and whatever else. I mean, one of the things we did do, as you're probably aware, is that we changed the penalty system uh, a couple of years ago, whereby older winners carried a, a lesser penalty in under when if they were to turn out again quickly than, than the younger horses do. We made changes to the weight for age scale, um, which gives the younger horses less of an allowance, both over uh, jumps and on the flat in the last five or six years. Certainly Phil started it on the, on the jumps and we can, can, uh, can, we've carried on with it over on the flat. Personally, I don't think we went far enough on the flat. I think we should be certainly over certain trips at certain times of year, we should have taken more of the allowance away. Um, the problem we have on the flat is that we have to work in unison with all the other European countries. We have the European pattern and whatever else. And the French in particular were not keen to uh, reduce the allowance that the three-year-olds were given. Now, I'm sure it's got absolutely nothing to do with a certain race on the first Sunday of October at Longchamp, but the cynic in says me it could be. Um, but no, 
it, in all seriousness, as I say, it's something we're very aware of. It's something I get regular telephone calls about. It's something that we look at statistically. Um, and certainly we are trying to work um, to being as fair as we possibly can to everybody. The problem is, of course, Dan, if you've got improving three-year-olds, there's nothing you can do to stop them. If you've got a horse, you know, that's just improving hand over fist, it doesn't matter what you do with it. It's going to keep winning until it either goes into group company or it, you know, it gets into a, a 0 to 100 or a 0 to 105 handicap or something. You, you just can't do anything about those horses. Well, we've been fortunate enough to have some of those young improving horses and enjoyed those times. But similarly, we've had those consistent older horses that we've you know, got a relationship yeah. to. We, we don't want to retire, but yet they're finishing constantly sort of, you know, maybe third or fourth and, and neither going up nor down. And we just find ourselves completely stuck. And, uh, yeah. I, you know, I think the points you raised are, are good. And I think, you know, I'm very pleased that you're very aware of them. Oh, no, as I say, I, 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 I'm more than aware of the, the shortfalls of the system. Um, but what I would say is I think we've got a very talented team of handicappers. Um, they all know their stuff. They're all very aware of the frustrations um, of owners, trainers, um, even jockeys on occasions who ride a particular horse a number of times will make their feelings plain about it if you happen to bump into them on the race course. Um, but I suppose the brutal truth is, Dan, you know, that there's, in, in the vast majority of cases, however hard we try, there's usually only going to be one winner of each race. Um, in a perfect handicapping world on the flat, um, given that the average field size and handicaps sort of wavers between 10 and 11, if we're doing our job absolutely perfectly and every horse is winning in its turn, which is what a handicapping system is supposed to do, then a horse should be winning one in 10, one in 11 of its starts on the flat. Over jumps, you should be probably winning one in seven, one in eight, something like that. But that's a very hard message to get across to people who are paying the bills because over jumps, that's seven or eight runs could be a season and a half. It could be two seasons. And if you're saying to people in a perfect handicapping world, you should only be winning one race a season or one race every season and a half. And on the flat, a similar situation, you know, you're supposed to win one in 10, one in 11. For most horses, that again is a season, a season and a half runs. And that's a very difficult message to get across to people that actually you're going to have to wait and we're going to allow you, we're not going to allow you, but in a, in a perfect system, you're winning one in 11. That's, that's a tricky message to get across and convince people is the right way. Yeah, very interesting. Well, let's, uh, let's just get, get a couple more questions in if, if that's okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's fine. Brilliant. So um, the Grand National, can we talk about the Grand National? Uh, we've we had a question, here, <laughs> a question here from Alan. Um, the, the best horses carry less weight than they should in a normal race. Why do we incentivize the best horses for a million pound race? Well, I think the initial answer to that, and you've probably struck the, the nail on the head um, in a certain way, is incentivize. Because you'll probably remember that um, not so many years ago, the National was struggling. Um, we, there were a number of years where we couldn't even get a full field. You know, we were running with 35, 36 horses, which for the, the nation's favourite race was, was appalling, really. Um, and Aintree and Phil Smith uh, came up with a plan to um, incentivize the best staying chasers in training to at least enter the race. Um, and they decided that the best way of doing that would to be to compress the weights at the top end um, and therefore, in essence, allowing them to run off a rating that would obviously be slightly below their park course form as long as they didn't have proven Grand National form. Um, it obviously worked. I mean, you know, the, in the same way that we've created a monster with Cheltenham, we've created a monster with the Grand National. Um, and the policy uh, worked. I think um, we've still got a little bit of a compression hangover. Um, obviously, it was a big um, topic of discussion this year in particular with Tiger Roll. I think um, we use it less now than we used to, and we are compressing less than we used to. I don't think, the, I mean, the race, I think, also has become um, less of a unique test. It is still a unique test, but it is less unique, if that is possible, than it was however many years ago. But one thing I would say, without getting too technical, um, and people have said, well, how do you justify that? Very much in the same way that your um, questioner asked there. How do you justify 
asking horses to run off in, 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 and I suppose in essence, perhaps giving them a theoretical advantage. And what I say to that is a lot of those horses will have gained their rating probably over three miles, maybe over three miles two on park courses where you would normally use about a pound a length. I think Martin actually uses about 0.8 a length, but somewhere between 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8 to one pound per length. Once you get up to four and a half miles, that weight is going to have a greater effect. And Martin would probably use 0 0.6 to 0.75 pounds per length over four and a half miles. So in essence, what you could say is in, in relation to their three mile two park course form to four and a half miles around the Grand National, carrying 11 stone 10 off 175 is going to be more of a burden than it would be over three miles two. So if you take, if you can scale it down a little bit, given that weight would have more effect and actually still, and this is, I'm probably not explaining it very well, still have a relativity between the horses that you would want, if you see what I mean. So if, for, if for instance, over um, three miles two, um, you said that X's superiority over Y was six pounds, over f using the same, you know, the pounds per length over four mile four, it's actually probably only four pounds because of the weight has more effect. So you can actually justify it from a handicapping perspective and a weight perspective um, that you perhaps aren't giving them as bigger advantages, perhaps the initial compression suggests they are. Hmm. Dan sort of went off, you went off into a sort of brown study there, Dan, you seem to be sort of a, a similar. No, what, what, what I was thinking about is, is that two miler has the same rating over two miles as three and a half miles. We don't change the ratings. If you have a... Yeah, a no, and listen, the, 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 all I'm saying, I was just looking for uh, a justification. I mean, without any doubt, and I'm not, I'm not going to, to lie to you, it was done originally to incentivize the best staying chasers in training to at least enter for the race and then assess whether they felt that it was, you know, worth their while taking their chance, taking advantage of what might have been a, a, a lenient mark. Um, but as I say, we're using it less and less. I think we only, I think the most we can press the horse this year was two pounds. Yeah. Um, and I suspect over time that may well disappear as well. But I think, I think your questioner is absolutely right. We've got a million pound race now. We're always going to fill it unless something untoward happens. Um, and I suspect the need for compression is gradually dying away. So another area we've had lots of questions about is, is, uh, is the Irish issue and obviously in particular in relation to Cheltenham. So yeah. could you just explain how the Irish system is, is different and therefore what you do in order to handicap the Irish horses? Yeah, it's an interesting one and it's an ongoing issue. Um, the, to be truthful, I suppose the best um, description of it is that it's the same but different. Um, they work on the same scale as us. They have a different weight for age scale from us, which although um, is certainly not the whole root of the problem, doesn't help. And one of the things that I was working on prior to uh, the suspension of racing and lockdown was trying to work with um, Martin Greenwood and Andrew Miller, who are my um, jumps team leaders and um, Andy Shaw in Ireland was to try and produce um, a unified weight for age scale for the use in both countries now hopefully that work will continue once we resume and once we're all back at work um, but obviously that's a little bit up in the air but it will happen I'm sure uh, as I say it won't take away the whole problem but I think it will help um, it really stems from Noel O'Brien um, and his, um, his, his handicapping methods, I suppose, his methodology. He wasn't as hard on horses as we are um, for whatever reason. Now, and what we found was that the Irish were coming over here and obviously I think there was one Cheltenham in particular where they, I won't say swept the board in all the handicaps, but certainly won the vast majority of them and there was a huge outcry and quite rightly, our trainers were saying, well, this is ridiculous. You know, that's the whole point of handicapping is that everybody has an equal chance and whatever else. So what we decided to combat that was that we would actually um, keep our own figures in, uh, in Ireland. So we could then compare when horses were entered over here. And it's not just a Cheltenham problem, Dan. You know, it, you, you've probably been, you've probably seen the results at Perth where Gordon comes over and wins five races out of the seven. Um, and you'll get Irish challenges at some of the smaller tracks, uh, Cartmel and, and wherever, Carlisle, and, and they'll come over and win handicaps. So it's not just a Cheltenham problem, but Cheltenham obviously highlights the issue. That's the one people like to latch onto. 
Um, so we keep our own ratings and as and when a horse is entered here, an Irish horse is entered here, we would normally use our own rating. Now, obviously, going back four or five years, when we first started this process, it caused absolute carnage because the, the Irish trainers were moaning and complaining and saying, it's not fair, you're being protectionist, you don't want us to come to Cheltenham. And you'll know that one or two high-profile people basically said, right, well, we're not coming. As a form of protest, we're, we're not going to run our horses. Um, that situation has now eased an awful lot. Last year, I had um, three emails, I think, all from the same trainer, all from the same owner uh, regarding the handicap rating uh, of three different horses. This year, I don't think I had a single email. Um, one or two people, I think, continue to believe that we were rating them too high, basically usually people that are based in Ireland. Um, but over the last two festivals, uh, we've won uh, five handicaps. The Irish have won five handicaps. Uh, last year, it was the same, five-five. And if you look at the first four placings uh, this year, I think the score was, uh, what have we got? We've got 40 placings, haven't we? So I think it was 21-19 in favour of the Irish on first four placings. So again, I, it's something that we're doing, something that we are monitoring closely, something that I want to, um, I want to bring about parity between the two scales, but obviously we have to, uh, make sure that Ireland are on board with that. And we can't seem to be bullying Ireland into doing something that they don't want to do. We have to make sure that they understand it's for the good of sport, for the unification of the sport. I mean, it, it strikes me as baffling that the two major jumps nations on the planet who are separated by a relatively thin strip of water can't actually have, uh, you know, two handicapping systems that are on same comparative levels. But, you know, we're working on it and hopefully we'll get there. So just to, to understand the the reference you made sort of maybe at Perth uh, is perhaps more relevant to us because we're much more likely to come across those sort of horses. So if if a horse from Ireland is entered to run, let's say at Perth, what happens? Do you go about watch its races and then give it a BHA handicap mark? Well, we'll have watched its races already in Ireland um, because we will, as we do with our domestic races, we will uh, rate those races within two or three days of them happening. Um, but it will appear on our entry sheet without a rating. Um, and then the boys will have to go and um, have a look at the horse, see what sort of performance ratings we've got. They will check its Irish rating just to see what the Irish handicapper thinks. Um, and then uh, they, they will put it in on what they believe an appropriate mark is, on what we believe their performances um, uh, suggest. I think one of the problems we've got at that particular end, um, Dan, is that um, a lot of, well, not a lot, but a good number of these horses that Gordon Elliott in particular brings over are horses that he's got from other people um, and who, whatever we do, are going to be on a bog standard rating. And he has taken them, stripped them down, put them back together again. And all of a sudden they're a 25 pound better horse than they were from the other, from their previous trainer. And there's just nothing we can do about that. We can't handicap a horse on who trains it. Um, you know, we, we have to go on what the horse has shown on the race course. And if, if Gordon gets one or Willie Mullins gets one that they improve 25 pounds, then there's nothing we can do about it. The only thing we can do is obviously once it's won and react to it. Interesting. And uh, so another question we've had, I mean, perhaps this might be our last question we've got time for. Um, when horses have been off the track for a while, often their rating is dropped. So, for example, a national hunt horse that, that gets an injury. Um, is, is there a set rule about that? Is the rule about how long they've been off the track, they get dropped so many pounds? Or, or how is that worked out and calculated? Well, it's, it, it's something what we used to do, uh, Dan, uh, was um, have a sort of loose rule of thumb that uh, it would usually be sort of three to four pounds per complete year missed or complete season missed. Um, but again, it would, in, it would um, depend on the horse's profile. So, for instance, 10-odd um, years ago, uh, there was a horse called Forgotten Voice, which some of you may or may not remember, it was owned by ex-BHA chairman Paul Roy um, and was injured after its two-year-old career and came back as a four-year-old. And uh, it had got relatively, well, it had got very solid form toward, towards the end of its two-year-old career. I think it had won its last certainly won its last race, maybe its last two races. And given his profile, young horse, he got no drop at all. 
Um, and that would be pretty standard practice. If a horse, you know, a young horse with absolutely rock solid progressive form before the injury, we probably wouldn't drop. Um, and as you probably remember, Forgotten Voice went on to win, well, it went on to win the Hunt Cup and finished third in the Sussex Stakes in the end. We, we used to do it a lot more than we do now. And I'll tell you the reason why we do it less is that we got quite badly burnt by Mr. Curley. You probably remember that uh, four timer that he landed. Um, I think it was probably on the all weather, wasn't it? One winter uh, where he got four old crocs fit enough to race and fit enough to win and landed the most almighty touch. And all four of them had had what we would probably discuss, just, you know, an injury drop or a, uh, an absence drop or a sympathy drop or whatever you want to call it. And we took a fair amount of stick for that. You know, don't you guys know the way that Curly works? He takes them away, sticks them in the field for two years. You drop them six pounds and back they come and bang, he's made a complete fool of you. And unfortunately, we can't treat Barney Curley any differently from everybody else. Um, you know, we, one of the things that one of our sort of watchwords is consistency, although a lot of people would say you're not consistent, but there is incons there's consistent inconsistency in there. But, you know, because we're treating each horse on its merits, you know, there, there will appear to be con uh, inconsistency, but as much as possible, we have to try and be consistent. And it would be wrong to say we're not going to drop any of Barney Curley's horses, but everybody else's will be dropped three or four pounds for, a, for a, an absence. So it's something we do less now, and it's something, but those that we do drop would be the ones that we feel were aggressive before the injury. They might now be seven, eight, nine years of age, you know, going back to the older horse issues. And we would feel, you know, we, we're not really taking much of a chance to give them another four or five pounds, given that they've had two years off. So, yeah, that, that's where we stand with that one. Dominic, thank you very much indeed for all your time today. I really do appreciate it. I'm well aware that we've we've gone over the time that uh, that I think we we'd agreed beforehand. So I'm very much appreciative. We've had lots and lots of questions. We've had lots of people involved, and I think that shows how fascinated everyone has been. Um, you've explained everything from sort of the the history of handicapping, why we do it, how we do it, um, and and it's really been you know really interesting. And I think we've all learned a huge amount. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Well, it's been a pleasure, Dan. And um, one of the things that I said when I took over from Phil was that, uh, you know, I, I don't see any reason why there shouldn't be transparency about handicapping. Um, for too long, people have continued, con considered it a bit of a sort of dark art and nobody quite knows how it works. And the handicappers are a little bit of a law unto themselves and they do what they fancy and nobody actually ever calls them to task and nobody asks them to justify. So things like this, I, 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 I'm perfectly willing, I enjoy doing because hopefully it demonstrates that you know we, we we'll hold our hands up and say we're not perfect but we're trying to do the best that we can for everybody within the system that we have well that's great well thank you again Dominic and I think we all appreciate that transparency which you know good communication transparency is is vital I think within racing and we very much appreciate you joining us today no problem and if you ever want to do anything similar Dan just drop me a line Thanks very much. Well, thank you. Well, I hope everyone managed to guess where, where I was today. So I've been visiting different race courses where Foxtrot have had a runner. Uh, Dominic, you don't know where I am, do you? Um, uh, well, I'm assuming if it's not Dundalk, is it somewhere in America? Actually, that's right. Well done, yeah. Saratoga. So we're in Saratoga today, where Von Romane ran in back in July. So we sent him over to America to run. Um, so had a bit of a high handicap rating, you see, over here. <laughs> <laughs> Probably came back with a higher one, did it? <laughs> so anyway, Saratoga today. So uh, so um, I'll be back in uh, Britain tomorrow when at 12 o'clock we are speaking to Ilona Bartlett from Stratford Racecourse. So she'll be talking about how racecourses have been affected by uh, the current situation. So I'm sure that'll be very interesting. I hope everyone will be joining us tomorrow at noon. But thank you very much for today. Thank you again to Dominic and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Dan.